right, so the topic for today is our personal holiness, personal holiness, also known as our progressive sanctification, or just sanctification, that's usually how we use the word in general. And the flow of today's class is going to be like this. So we want to figure out how does the Bible use this word, sanctification? How does the Bible use this word? How does it define it? And then we're going to come up with a definition of sanctification based on how the Bible uses that word and talks about the, the concept. And then we're going to, so that's, that's going to be the gist. It's going to be the gist of the class. And then we're going to end by looking at another popular view of sanctification briefly, just to, uh, I find it helpful that uh, whenever I'm, I'm, I'm studying how, uh, you know, the, the orthodox view or the, the reformed view of something, I find it helpful to know what other people are, are thinking about it and see how has that influenced my life? How has that influenced maybe some of my friends so I can be able to just uh, be educated there and understand that? So that's kind of, then we're going to see why that view fails, although you'll probably be able to see that just based off of how different it's gonna, they're going to be. So with that said, what do you all typically think of when you think of the word sanctification? What do you guys typically think of? What pops into your mind? You hear the word sanctification, your mind goes, what? Being set apart. Being set apart. Okay. Grace? Becoming more Christ-like. Christ yeah. And I think that that's, I think that that's, those two are the main ways that we typically think of sanctification. But the Bible uses it, this word, in a few different ways. So let's dive in. Let's dive in. How does the Bible use this word sanctification? Turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 6. 1 Corinthians 6. We're going to look at verses 9 through 11. First Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Okay, I'm going to read this and pay attention, pay close attention to how Scripture uses the word sanctification here. It says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and by the Spirit of our God. And so, one of the questions that pops up into my mind, because I always think of this word, uh, sanctification, just how you guys said, it's uh, becoming more Christ-like, it's being transformed, it's being changed. Uh, and yet, in 1 Corinthians 6, 9-11, it's talking past tense. It's past tense. You were sanctified. So what does that mean? Uh, there are three words that are all used here to describe this past act that happened to us. So this is, this is a hint. What are the three words that it used that are, that are all used right here to describe sanctification? It says, but you were washed, you were sanctified, and you were justified. Okay, so they're using all of these interchangeably. So you were washed, so the washing is the same thing as the sanctifying, and the sanctifying is the same thing as the justifying that happened. Okay, so we were washed, sanctified, and justified. Okay, now turn to Acts 20. Turn to Acts 20. And we're going to look at verse 32. So we're just trying to unveil what Scripture how Scripture uses this word. This is fascinating. I, I, I just even 
uh, have learned that the Bible uses this differently uh, recently. So Acts 20, verse 32, it says, And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among, among all those who are sanctified. Among all those who are sanctified. So what do you think? Do you think, is this word in Acts 20, for sancti- uh, how, it uses, how Scripture uses this word in Acts 20, verse 32, do you think that's the same as the previous passage? The other one said were, you were sanctified. This one says you are sanctified. Is it using it in the same way? Is it past progressive? Yeah, yeah. Is it, uh, you were sanctified, and so now you are sanctified. So it is. We could, we could substitute washed or justified in its place here. So it's, it's fascinating. The, the Bible will use this word sanctification, sanctified, to talk about uh, the past, something that has happened to you in the past. And notice that it's also something that is passive. It's something that happened to you. You were washed, so we're, we're passive. It's something that happened to us. You were sanctified. So this is what theologians call past sanctification, positional sanctification, if you will. So, if you see some indication that Paul is talking about the past and or Christians who currently are sanctified, he's most likely talking about uh, the moment of justification. He's talking about that moment when we were justified. So sanctification, our past or positional sanctification, happens when we are justified. When we are justified. Now, the Bible will sometimes talk about this concept without using the technical word sanctification, but the concept is, is still there. And this brings me to, uh, I think, two weeks ago, when we were talking about Romans 6. Right? So go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Romans 6, and we see, once again, this, this concept that in the past, something happened. In the past, something happened. We're going to look at verses, we're going to just look at verses 11 and verse 14. Just 11 and 14. So verse 11 says this, So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. And then verse 14, For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. So once again here, Paul is talking about past or positional sanctification. This is when we were justified, right? Consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God. And we talked about this two weeks ago, like I said, but it's worth worth it to revisit it. So our, our sanctification begins when we are justified. So when we are saved and we're declared righteous by God, our journey to become holy begins. That's when it begins. And why is that? Because we are purchased by a new master, brought into a new home, and we're subject to a new king, and we are now loved. Right? Do you guys remember those four categories from two weeks ago? We have a new master, we have a new home, we have a new king, and we are now loved. Okay, that all happens at that moment. All four happen. Okay, that's important. So that's what happens when we are granted faith and repentance. It's a completed action that happened in the past, and it happened to us passively. God acted upon us. Remember, we're, faith and repentance are gifts, right? They're given to us. So that's, that's passive. It's given to us. In the same way, this past sanctification is, is passive. We're transferred from the old master to the new. Okay? So answer one, Scripture uses the word sanctification to describe our past sanctification when we were justified and given a new master, king, and father. Alright? Makes sense so far? 
Now, so we looked at verses 11 and 14 in Romans 6. Now let's look at verses 12 and 13. Look at verses 12 and 13. It says, Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. And then once again, look down at uh, verse 19. So skip a few verses, look at verse 19. Just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. Leading to sanctification. So, in what way is the Bible using this word this time? I'd say that the Bible is saying that this act is something active we do, right? We're commanded, so we have been sanctified, but we're also commanded to continue being sanctified, right? So this is something active we do. It's commanded, and it's something that we continuously work towards. So we're slaves to righteousness, and it leads to sanctification. So it's something we're working towards. And notice here that we are the ones working, right? We pass sanctification, passive, and this new way of sanctification the Bible uses is active, okay? And it's commanded. And once again, Scripture talks about this concept. So, uh, Scripture talks about sanctification, but it doesn't always have to use that word, okay? We do this all the time, and that makes sense. So, <clears throat> in many places, we get this idea of uh, this kind of sanctification without the Bible using the word. For example, I'm just going to list some off here. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says this, And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, and in Colossians 3, 9 through 10, it says, Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. So, and now this is fascinating because there's a subtle shift from Romans 6, 19 and 12 and 13. In those passages, it says, you, you sanctify yourself. Right? That's what those are saying. And then 2 Corinthians 3.18, Colossians 3, 9 through 10, are saying, you are being transformed, and you are being renewed. So what's, what's the difference here? What's the difference here? We see that uh, the agent of change in these verses is God. So God is the one who is transforming us. God is the one who is renewing us. He's the one who is transforming and changing us. But we're also commanded to change. Okay, listen to a few more verses here. Hebrews 12.1 says this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And then in verse 14 of Hebrews 12, it says, Strive for peace with everyone, and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. James 1.22, be doers of the word, not hearers only. 1 Peter 1, verse 15 through 16, be holy, for I am holy. So we see over and over and over again, we see God is working in us. He's transforming us. He's changing us, renewing us. He uses all of this different kind of language. And it also says, you, 
be holy, for I am holy. Right? You be doers of the word and not hearers only. You sanctify yourself as God is sanctifying you. Right? So what, what can we conclude from this? We, we can conclude that our past sanctification, so what happened in the past, that was passive because faith and repentance are gifts, right? Uh, God gave us new hearts. He breathed life into dead bones. But this new kind of sanctification called progressive sanctification, this is how we usually think about the word, progressive sanctification or present sanctification. This is not only passive, but it is active, okay? This is also going to be very important for later, okay? It's passive and active. So the, the uh, proper way to say this is that our past sanctification was monergistic. It was monergistic, okay? God was the only one who, who was working there. It was monergistic. And... Uh, our progressive sanctification is synergistic. It's synergistic, meaning that God works in us and we work in us to grow in holiness. Okay? And progressive sanctification is the only synergistic work in salvation. Okay? Sanctification is a part of uh, the, the self, the ordo salutis, right? Sanct or our salvation. And it's the only. Progressive sanctification is the only synergistic work. Okay? The rest is monergistic. So, answer to number two as to how the Bible uses this term. The Bible uses the word sanctification to describe presence or progressive sanctification where both God and man, they work together. They work together for man to become more holy. Okay, but I will use the word sanctification to describe present, progressive sanctification where both God and man work together to become more holy. Now, to springboard us into our next answer, we have to think about, we have to think about this question. Right? Why are we commanded to, sancti to sanctify ourselves and why does God work in us to sanctify us? when God has already sanctified us in the past, right? Like, how does that make sense? How does that make sense? And if you were thinking that, then you get a gold star, okay? That's a, that's a great question. The answer is this. So in the past, in the past we were positionally sanctified, but we're not yet physically sanctified, right? So we are declared righteous, Justification is a declaration of our righteousness, right? That's, that's the definition of justification. So we're declared righteous and holy before God. So we're positionally changed. We're positionally changed. Old master, new master. Old family, old family new family, right? Uh, old king, new king, okay? We are positionally changed, sanctified, but we're not yet physically sanctified. Right, we're not yet actually physically moved there. So, what this means is that we still live in sinful bodies, on a sinful world, where the flesh and the spirit wage war against one another. Okay? Because we're not physically changed yet. And this is where our last category gives us a full answer. So, sanctification is in the past. It is in the present, but it's also in the future, okay? And Scripture only gives us pictures of this sanctification without actually using the word, which, uh, which is, is fine. We talk about concepts without using the, the word all the time. So, we can definitely find this concept in many passages. So think we're going through Philippians. We haven't gotten to Philippians 3 yet, but we will. In Philippians 3.21... 20 through 21, Paul says this, But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will 
transform, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. And this particular text is very fascinating because it hits, it hits on all three. It hits on all three areas of sanctification, okay? But our citizenship is in heaven. That is past positional sanctification. And from it, we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're waiting currently. We await a Savior. That's, that's what we do in the present. That's progressive sanctification. And then thirdly, uh, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body. That is future sanctification. So our bodies will be transformed to be like his glorious body when Christ comes. Right? Praise God. These sin-riddled bodies will finally be no more. They will be gone. Right? We will be given new ones when Christ comes back. But there's, there will most likely be a time where we are dead before Christ comes back, right? Most likely. So what happens to our bodies and spirits then? So we get a new... Uh, when we die, we're separated from our body and our spirits go to be with the Lord, but we don't have new bodies yet. Right? So what happens, what happens to our spirits then? That's a good question. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Hebrews 12.23. Hebrews 12.23, it says this. Uh, well, verse 22 through 23. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festival gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. Okay, that's the key. The spirits of the righteous made perfect. When we die, our spirits are made perfect. Right, so we're, we're not in heaven still awaiting for our glorious new bodies so that we can... Uh, so that sin will be cast away from us, right? No, our spirits are made perfect and while our bodies are in the ground, okay? So, I thought I had one more verse here. That's okay. So how does Scripture use this word sanctification? Scripture uses this word sanctification to describe the future sanctification of our spirits when we die and the future glorification of our bodies when Christ comes back. So that the Philippians 3.21 talks about our, our bodies will be transformed, and then Hebrews 12.23, our spirits are transformed in the meantime, before we get new bodies. Okay, so, so how does Scripture use this word sanctification? Scripture uses this word to describe future sanctification of our spirits when we die, and also the future glorification of our bodies when Christ comes back. So, all right, let's do a, let's do a brief recap. Brief recap. Someone tell me what was answer number one to how Scripture describes sanctification. Someone tell me. Shout it out loud and proud, Emma. Yeah, past sanctification. Scripture uses this word, describe past <laughs> sanctification. Yes. This is, and that happens when we are justified, right? And when we're justified, uh, we're given a new master, a new king, a new father, right? And we are loved, right? So, answer number two, what was, this is the, the more common way, and this, it's totally fine to use, just call this sanctification, but what was answer number two? What was this called? Present sanctification? Also, progressive sanctification? 
Yep. This is where both God and man, they work together. They work together, active and passive. Okay? And answer number three is what? Future, future. Future sanctification. Future sanctification. It's also called glorification. Okay? Future sanctification, glorification. You got it. So, and that is, that kind of goes without saying, that's passive. You just die, right? You just, that's passive. Okay. So, now that we have discussed the biblical view of sanctification, there's, okay, I want you to be at least familiar with what is probably the other most popular way to view sanctification. And this, this view is, I wish I could say that it was kind of, you know, like not being as popular, but I think it's, it's still out there uh, big time. It used to be um, Dallas Theological Seminary, they're, they're better now, but they used to be like the main proponents of this kind of theology, okay? Influenced uh, D.L. Moody, influenced a whole bunch of guys, okay? Even uh, Hudson Taylor, yep, he was... Uh, it's called, this view is called Keswick, or you, uh, if you're familiar with it, it's K-E-S-W-I-C-K, so a lot of people say Keswick, Keswick theology, but it's pronounced Keswick, okay, so it's Keswick theology, or it's also called higher life view, and uh, some great men of God uh, have held to this view, Hudson Taylor, member of great missionary, fantastic missionary, and he was a Keswick theologian, so that this is, uh, this is very popular. And these theologies oftentimes affect us without us knowing. So, we need, to, we need to know this position. The idea is basically this. This is a different view of, this is a completely different view of sanctification. Okay? It's completely different. It's this. Justification. So let's say this is justification. And sanctification, they happen at two different points in the Christian's life. Okay? So, you're justified here, you're sanctified over here. In our view, it's like this, okay? Justification, sanctification, past sanctification happens, boom, right here, right here. But in this view, you're justified, and then sometime later, you're gonna be, you're gonna start being sanctified, okay? Two different points, and this creates two different categories of Christians, because you can be, a, you're a Christian in here, you're a Christian, and in here, you're a Christian, but you're two different kinds of Christians, okay? There's two different kinds, categories of Christians. Carnal and spiritual. Carnal and spiritual. I touched on this a little bit two weeks ago. So a Christian is saved, and then for some period of time, that Christian lives a life of defeat. In fact, well, uh, they, this is the normal experience for all Christians. And many Christians can be saved and never change at all. So you can, be sa- you can be saved and live your whole life never changed, okay? But for those who do end up changing, it doesn't happen here. It happens sometime over here, okay? At whatever point. And that point is called a crisis moment, okay? You get here, and eventually in your life, you're just living your life, and then boom, crisis. Crisis moment. And this is, um, this is where a lot of even like camps and things like that, they try to manipulate kind of the environment so that you have this crisis moment, okay? So you're putting all this, think through all the implications of this, okay? You wanna have this crisis moment where you, yes, you were a Christian, but now you're really a Christian. You're a spiritual Christian now, right? So this is like hitting rock bottom, right? You finally come to a place where you recognize, and this is key, you recognize that you cannot work to fight your sin. You can't work to fight your sin. It's not working. Like, you trying is not working. So you need to stop trying. That's your problem. Right? It is God who solely must work in you. 
So why have I been making a big deal about this whole passive and active thing? Well, because in this view, you're passive only, right? Justification and sanctification are uh, faith alone, right? They are only passive. They're only passive, okay? So, yeah, justification is, it's, so it's monergistic in this view, and sanctification is as well. It's monergistic. You have nothing to do with it. You have nothing to do with it. And this brings, so if, have you ever heard the phrase, and there's been popular songs that work off this phrase, have you heard the phrase, let go and let God? And you see like bumper stickers, all sorts of stuff yeah. like that. Just, man, just let go and let God. Just let go and let God. You see, you know, Jesus, take the wheel. Jesus, just take the wheel of my life, right? That's bad. So when you do this, it transitions you, though. When you let go and let God, when Jesus takes the wheel, uh, it transitions you from carnal Christian to spiritual Christian. So boom, you have your crisis, now you're a spiritual Christian because you realize that you have to actually be passive. And now you can live a life of victory over sin. And not just any victory, by the way, also in this view, you can live a life where you don't sin at all. You have no conscious awareness of, of any sin that you're doing, right? So you, you functionally have no sin. Now, they would still affirm, so this, is a type, this is a type of perfectionism. Wesleyan perfectionism says that, yeah, you can completely get rid of your sin. That's, that's Wesleyan perfection. This is another type of perfectionism. It's not Wesleyan, but it is still a type. So they would have affirm that you still have sin inside of you, but the Spirit is counteracting that sin. Okay, do you see the difference? You still have sin, it's just being counteracted. So you functionally you don't sin. Functionally you don't sin. Now this, obviously, that based on how, when we let Scripture define this word for us, we see that this is just not, this is just not the case. In fact, Keswick theology is not true, it's not right. It's because the sanctification process begins when we are justified. Okay? If you get anything out of this, sanctification begins when we are justified and when we are being progressively sanctified throughout the whole rest of our life, it is active and passive. Okay? If you get those two things from this class, you're good. You're good. That'll, that'll help you combat any uh, most heresies, right? So, yeah, we're commanded. We're commanded to be sanctified or to sanctify ourselves while God is working it in us. So, very, very basic, very, very basic overview. But I, I have eight implications of this. First, are there any, are there any clarifying questions? Any questions in general? before I get to some of these implications. Yeah, it's pretty basic. Most of us kind of know, okay, progressive sanctification. Yeah, I kind of get how that works. You know, be more holy, be like Christ. And it's God works that in us. Okay, that makes sense. Carolyn. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And so living a surrendered life is that part of my life where I'm actively participating in the sanctification process that God mm -hmm. is Yeah. Yes. So it's, uh, we are, I think that's a good point. So we are to live a surrendered life. Like, don't hear me saying that, hey, don't live a surrendered life. Uh, but what they're saying when they say, let go and let God, they're saying completely, like it's, a, it's completely letting go. It's, it is, you're a completely passive. You don't do anything. Like this, uh, and, and part of this is, uh, two weeks ago I was talking about wardship salvation, okay, which isn't a good way to say that, but it's, 
term that people use. So lordship salvation versus this versus easy believism. This um, so in their view, when you are saved, when you are justified, uh, you just have to intellectually believe in God, right? So, and then whenever you are uh, at this at this further moment over here, then that's whenever you surrender your life, and that surrender is not how we think of it, right? That surrender is uh, com- completely passive, and you don't have to do anything. So that's kind of that's kind of how they work that out. Yeah. Yes. 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 So, so long as you mean the right thing <laughs> when you say it. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Yes. Like, what is, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so here's, here's eight implications. Let me give them to you. Number one, those who are truly saved, they will evidence fruit of that salvation by becoming more holy because God is working in them. Those who are truly saved, they will evidence fruit of that salvation by becoming more holy because God is working in them. Yeah, we'll leave it at that. uh, Number two, people change at different paces. Okay, people change at different paces. We have to accept that because there is a human synergistic work that must work with God to grow in holiness. So, I mean, oftentimes we can be frustrated or we can think. We have, we have to be very careful when we say like, oh, that person's probably not a Christian. It's like, okay, slow down. People change at different paces. Do you see any fruit in their life? Like really... Really think about that before you say it, okay? People change at different paces because it's not completely passive. Like, we have to actually work to be progressively sanctified, right? And because of that, people change at all kinds of different paces. Some people run, some people walk, some people crawl, okay? Number three, to have victory over sin and a life of holiness, you must do so as a converted, saved Christian, Okay? To have this victory over sin and live a life of holiness, you must do so as a converted, saved Christian. How do we change? Well, we, ch- we start changing when we're justified. We start changing when we are saved. Okay? And if that is true, then to change, you need to be saved. Right? For perhaps the reason that many people who claim to be Christians struggle with overcoming their sin is because they have not been saved and have not repented of their sin. Okay? So perhaps the Christians who, who struggle with overcoming their sin is because they have not been saved because they have not repented of their sin. So hold that intention with implication number two. Okay? Hold those intention. Um, and also recognize that uh, we can have inclinations like, oh, that person's probably not a Christian, but... Uh, it's probably not wise to walk up to someone and be like, hey, you're not a Christian. We say, God is judge, and we can point people to say, like, hey, Scripture says that you really ought to be having fruit and to examine ourselves. So I, I think that you should examine yourself. But uh, don't go whole hog saying, eh, no, brother, you're probably not a Christian. That's just, to me, that just doesn't seem wise. It doesn't seem... Just tell them to, they need to examine themselves and, and explain why. Explain why. Number five, uh, we can never be rid of sin in this life, but we can and are commanded to be continuously overcoming our sin and becoming more holy. We're never going to be rid of sin in this life, but we can, and, and we can because we've been positionally sanctified. So we have the power to be sanctified, uh, to sanctify ourselves because of that reality, and we are commanded to be continuously overcoming our sin and becoming more holy. Okay? Number six, carnal Christian is not a permanent category of Christian because all Christians will have some fruit in their life. There's no such thing as being a carnal Christian your entire life. 
Okay. If you are in this category of carnal Christian, you are probably not a Christian. Examine yourself, right? So examine yourself. If there's no change, examine yourself. Scripture says you will change. Number seven, we will actually have less sin in us as time goes forward. Um, this kind of gets into the weeds a little bit. Uh, Keswick theology says that you always have the same amount of sin in you. So like, there's no such thing as mortifying sin or killing sin. Uh, it's always there in its full force. You are sinful and it's, it always stays the same. You have to counteract that by letting go and letting God, and the Spirit does that to counteract. So, uh, I could have taken that one out, but we will actually we will actually have less sin in us as time goes forward, as we're going from present, uh, we're positional sanctification to glorification. Like we will actually have less sin. More like this, right? Ooh, like this. We will actually have less sin, getting closer to that glorified person. Eight, letting go and letting God just isn't biblical uh, in the way that they use that phrase. We must actively submit our lives to God and turn from our sin by doing the spiritual disciplines. So we have to actively submit our lives to God and turn from our sin by doing the spiritual disciplines. And that's what Peter's going to talk about next week. So... Let's close with prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for this time once again. And uh, as I always pray, Lord, uh, just because it's such a struggle for me, please help us not only to know things. Knowing things is good, but we need to live them out. We need to live them out. Lord, help us not only to see Christ but also to savor Christ, Lord. Uh, we, just, we can't do this without the help of your Spirit. And uh, so we pray that you would help us. Help us as we actively pursue you, as we actively pursue our holiness. Help us to remember to, uh, to rely on you as we're doing that, because we have to have your help. We have to have your help. Um, and so we just pray for this in Christ's name. Amen.